is predicated on your existence as a human in a dominance hierarchy, and that's what makes that judgment of the fact that this sort of behavior is wrong true because of the biological context almost. Sure. Which, sure, it's which deep. Yeah, yeah, well, it's more than that because, like, as an individual, I'm an individual, but as a human, I'm not an individual at all. I'm this unbelievably old thing. I'm like as old as life. I'm really old. Well, there's the me in this, which is this thing that was like come around in 1962. But there's the deeper reality of this thing that I am. And that's, the, you could say, well, that's the union self. That's one way of looking at it. But, and it has its nature. It's the human nature. Not, well, good and evil are human terms. You know, now whether they refer to something transcendent, that's a whole different question. It is not a simple question because we don't know what role consciousness plays in being. So, I, I, th like the deepest strata of thought that I've encountered makes the case that the most real thing is the eternal battle between good and evil. And I'm prone to believe that. So, well, what exactly that means, that's a, that's a different story. It's a complicated idea. So, to, to the, just my, the, the inner uh, materialist in my brain now is saying, but, that, that's a confusion of facts and values, but what, what I'm, what I'm uh, assuming that you would say back, and correct me and tell me mm -hmm. what you would say back, even as a, as a materialist scientist, you yourself are a human participating in this human drama. You're, you're right, and, you're well, well, and we would... You're what's embedded in what. Yes, that's right. You're, that's exactly right. That's right, because that's the question. Objective reality, mythology. One proposition. Mythology... Objective reality, another proposition. That's my proposition. It's like, this is way deeper than this. It's, it's incomparably deeper. Now, that doesn't mean this isn't deep. It's deep, but it's, it's, it's sterile, and that's dangerous. And then when you forget which is embedded in which, then you make mistakes. It's like, yeah, well, why not cross Ebola with smallpox? Well, th that's a good question. Why not do it? Well, you know, a rationalist would say, well, I'm, I'm capable of making that judgment. So, okay, well, let's really specify that. What exactly do you mean that you're capable of making that judgment? Because, again, with Dawkins and, and his ilk, you know, they make the claim that they can have their cake and eat it too. So they can have all the benefits of an evolved morality, which is basically a Judeo-Christian morality in the West, and they can say, well, yeah, but we don't have to accept any of the metaphysical presumptions. It's like, says who? Like, yeah, you could be right, but why would you assume that you are? So maybe the meta, this is Nietzsche's point, maybe the metaphysical presuppositions are absolutely necessary. So, and, and the question then is, as understood <clears throat> by their, by, by the, the millennia old individuals or cultures that gave birth to them, or reinterpreted as, as pre-conscious symbology? You see what I'm saying? No, no, no not exactly. You okay, have to specify because, that more. Right, because then Dawkins might say, or, you know, uh, or let's, I'll try not to pick on them. Uh, let's, mm -hmm. But then the, the materialist, positivist, rationalist yeah. might say, um, okay, but what does it mean to accept that mythology or to accept the metaphysics? Does it mean that I have to believe that there's this omnipresent, um, you know, uh, uh, sadistic God who, who pits nations against each other and, and orders you to, you know, to, to murder your, your neighboring tribe? Or... Rather, is it necessary to accept that meta those metaphysical, the metaphysical background or the substrate, if you will, in as understood now, in, as um, mm, symbolic imagery from a culture that had no other means of articulating it? So that, because because then they might say, well, sure, I, I can, you know, I can accept that it has some value in its time and place, but so. Uh, oh, but okay. That's where I would. That's where the the problem would start for me. It's go. still that time and place. You know, you get this idea too that like the evolutionary psychologists do this. Well, our evolutionary, where we evolved was the African savanna, and you know our moral systems are adapted. It's like why, why, why there? Like why not in the oceans three hundred million years ago? You know, like when? Why is that the preferential place from which our values are derived? The rest of it's just nothing. It's like, I don't understand that. It makes no sense to me at all. Well, you, you could say that's where we differentiated from chimps. 
It's like, well, so what? We're not that different from chimps. So, you know, what about the chimps? They have a lot of share a lot in common with us. They didn't go through the savanna. It's like, so the idea that these values, say, are shallow, I mean, if you put it in an evolutionary basis and you go back to the African savanna, well, that's something. It's, you know, a few million years anyways. But to me, that's still icing on the cake. It's, it's not deep enough. This is way deeper. Now, the metaphysics. Okay, well, let's talk about the metaphysics. Okay, whose idea of God are you talking about? It's like, is God an old man with a beard? And he lives in the sky? Okay, well, let's take that argument apart a little bit. Okay, first of all, the ancient Jews, they didn't like you to say the name of God. Why? Because they didn't want you to confuse the representation with the phenomena. So whatever was real for them was something beyond words. Okay, the same thing obtains with Taoism. Same idea, right? Don't make a graven image because you confuse the damn image with the thing. What's the thing? It's that which is beyond imaging. Does that which beyond is beyond imaging exist? Obviously. What's its nature? Well, that's a different question. Now, in the Old Testament, its nature is arbitrary, man. It's like, look the hell out. You're going to get swatted down. But if you look carefully at the structure of the Old Testament, and Northrop Fry did this, Fry's argument was basically this. Well, you've got the really old stories. Forget about them. History starts basically with Abraham. What is the Old Testament about? The Israelites climb up to dominance. They get corrupt. They forget about the widows and the children. God, a prophet comes up and says, you better look out. You're off the path. They ignore them. Whap! They're in chaos for like a long time. They get all humble and they build themselves up again. And when they get power, they get all corrupt. And a prophet comes along and says, you better look out. You're off the path. You're not paying attention to the widows and the children. And all hell's going to break loose. Like, bang, down they go. Six times. Six times. So, you know, is that arbitrary? Or is that actually the right idea to derive from history? It's like power corrupts. So you make your kingdom, you make your empire, and it's serving its proper purpose. But you let it get corrupt, things are going to fall apart. So I, I can give you an example of that. It's like, what caused the flooding in New Orleans? A hurricane. No. No, corruption. If the dikes would have been built properly, as everyone knew they should have been built, if all those millions of dollars had gone into the pockets of corrupt politicians, there wouldn't have been any flood. In Holland, they build the dikes for the worst storm in 10,000 years. In New Orleans, they built them for the worst storm in 100 years. Well, everyone knew that was insufficient. So why didn't they do something about it? Well, if you get corrupt enough, God will send a flood. It's like it's an old story. It's it's right. It's right. Now, the question is, who is God? Well, I would say the, the ancient Israelites never made, they never said who God was. They just said, look the hell out for him. You deviate from the path, man, you're going to get flattened. The people who wrote that book, first of all, like it was assembled loosely as a book, right? It's a bunch of books. That's what Bible means. It was edited and assembled across vast stretches of time. We have no idea what process led people to assemble it that way, except that they felt that that made sense. You know, so they were guided by their inter internal intuition of meaning. Weirdly enough, it produced a document with a narrative. Now, the narrative is difficult in some ways to discern, given all the detail, you know. So I would say... Give our ancestors a break, for God's sake. What do you want? You want absolute, perfect coherence? When they're trying to be so inclusive? Like, it's very hard to be coherent when you're trying to be inclusive. Those two things battle. So, you know, have a little respect. That's, what, that's how it looks to me. Those people weren't stupid. They were seriously not stupid. And what they thought was not stupid. Now, we can, we can look at it in other ways. Why is God in the sky? Well, I know you can't see it in the city. What's the fastest way to see infinity? I'll look up at the night sky. It's like, why is God up there? Because when you look at the night sky, that's how you feel. So is that wrong? Well, it's not bad. You know, it's like, well, where's the infinite? Because that's really the question. Well, it seems to be up there. It's like, yeah, right. 
Okay, so you make your sacrifices. It's like, why do people do that? God, that's primitive. It's like, no. The, the invention of the sacrifice was probably the single greatest stroke of genius that mankind ever was, was, was given or produced. What is a sacrifice? You give up something of value now so that things might be better in the future. It's like, that's the human discovery. That's the human discovery of time. Everybody makes sacrifices. It's like, I'm going to go to university instead of partying and, you know, snorting cocaine. It's like, because that's fun.